Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today I'm joined by my brother, the Gritty Broman. How are you, Brent? I'm well, thank you. Cool. I thought that uh, we were just talking about a subject that has come up now and then, and that's how to not get mauled by a bear. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah, right? Like, how do you, what do you do to try to avoid getting mauled by a bear? There was a post on our uh, Gritty Stealthy community at Locals uh, today, in fact, where this bear, this black bear, just waltzes right into a gas station in a grocery store, um, cruises right in. I think it was on um, a mount, a meat eater post somewhere. But yeah, this bear um, steals candy from a gas station. And it's a big old black bear. And the the dude tries to chase it away. Is the black bear really stealing? <laughs> I mean, that would indicate. Well, I mean, he's taking it, it without buying it. Yes, but there's like, I feel I just don't know if that 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 that's the right term for it. Well, it shows in these separate videos that in Lake, it's it's like uh, Lake Tahoe convenience store in the snack aisle at the gas station. We're not, we're talking like serious. Um, it's gone. It goes into a seven 11. Um, you know, the guy at the store is like fighting off black bears is not in my job description. You see this bear in the produce aisle of like, like a Safeway looking store. And it's just grabbing whatever it wants off the thing. It just went through the front doors and started grabbing stuff. <laughs> it's in there 17 minutes and then gets done and waltzes out. Okay. That's a good time. So the gas station one's a little eerie. I mean, the the guy, I don't know what people are thinking, but a big old, big old black bear comes through the door at the gas station. And the mm-hmm. dude's like, hey, hey. And he's like from, he's like from here to that outlet. I mean, he's like two feet. The bear could reach out and snag him. Yeah. He's not, if the bear wants him, he ain't getting away right. time. And the no guy's way. like, ah, and he does this. And the bear goes. Opens his mouth and jumps, and the guy stumbles backwards, and the bear just walks right past him and goes into the store. Like, the bear did not get intimidated by this guy. Any bear that is bold enough to walk into a gas station, Mm -hmm. convenience store, or grocery store, ain't going to be scared of you when you go, and try to scare it. Maybe the first time he did it, but not after like the ninth time. If he's got, yeah. He, you get, the funny thing is this bear just walk, comes in, and the guy's like right here. Mm-hmm. See him run away. The bear's like jumps right at him. It's on the news. And this is this is a fat old black bear. Big old belly. Um, so that's the thing. When it comes to grizzly bears and black bears, a lot of times I feel the risky ones are the ones that are never hunted. That's one. And that encounter humans a lot. Mm -hmm. They become bold and dangerous. Okay. Those are the ones you want to watch out for. Um, so there are things that you can do. I'll go through kind of the list of things that we did this year. Um, and we try to do first off is bears are, are irrational when it comes to food. You know, there's that old stereotype and the jokes that people make about bears. Winnie the Pooh, right? He's obsessed with honey, mm-hmm. right? It's because it's true. So you know how bull elk or a rutting mule deer lose their mind mm-hmm. or a rutting whitetail buck when it's time to breed? It's the rut. They lose their mind. They're willing to die. They have no rational thinking. They'll come running into you and you can stand there and bugle and they'll see that you're a human and they still want to fight you. Like sometimes they just lose it or you'll shoot a buck and a buck will just come up and just fight that dead buck for five minutes, just stabbing it and mm-hmm. fighting it. it. The thing's dead. It, it's just the rage is at an all time. I'm curious if that black bear has a name. You said it was near Tahoe, right? Yeah. Okay. So I looked up another bear because there's this famous bear in mm-hmm. t-shirt. And they call him that because he has a huge white spot on his chest. Look, he's wearing like a white tank top or something mm-hmm. when he stands up. Fat black bear, Brian. These are all I mean, chocolate. Okay. This one, no, this is a black bear from this uh, one. Lake Tahoe. He got stuck in a dumpster. Besides its weekly raid on the snack <laughs> aisle, the bear also broke into a Safeway gro- grocery store and crashed a birthday party to eat cake. <laughs> 
Uh, authorities eventually trapped the 16 year old bear and relocated it to an undisclosed wilderness area. Thanks for that. Yeah. And that's the thing I want to get to is it's a place called my freezer. Yeah. They'll, <laughs> they'll drop these bears, these problem bears mm-hmm. off in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Where do I like to hunt? The middle, the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and so you just need to be careful. You never know when you're out there. You might think you're way, 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 way far away from Yellowstone mm-hmm. where there's some belligerent ba- bears. Mm-hmm. But what you don't know is they took that bear that's been hassling campers and people, and they mm-hmm. just picked it up and they took just it to... mean mugging humans for a couple of years. <laughs> took it to the wilderness area in which you're very, 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 very far from uh-huh. Yellowstone. And they drop it there. And then you waltz out thinking you're in a, uh, an area where they've never seen humans. Mm-hmm. And in fact, they're just, they're missing their old buddies that they can just steal from without being stopped. So like I said, back to the bears and their food, they're obsessive. They're like a rut, a rutting bull elk or a rutting mule deer. There's no rationale. They lose their mind. They, they throw caution to the wind. So you need to not tempt them. You need to not s- do the food thing in a way that tempts them, gets them excited, gets them turned on to the point where they're willing to do some dumb things or, or be dangerous in order to have that food. They're just, they're pre-programmed to be obsessive, aggressive, dominant. You'll see one bear on a carcass and a bigger bear comes along. But once that young, that smaller bear has that carcass, it's almost willing. It's so willing to fight. It's like a mom and her cubs. They're willing to go the distance in a way that maybe the bear that's new doesn't. They become so possessive over food and the things they take that it's that that's where the danger is. So that just goes to say you need to be really careful with food. You need to be really responsible with food, blood, guts. Um, skinning, gutting, hanging meat, and how you handle that. And I think that's one, one of the major things to keep yourself safe. That's one first layer is is keep the, the scent of food and all those tempting smells, you know, away from you as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So I go so far as even when I backpack in, I try not to bring foods that are, overly especially in grizzly country that are overly smelly like, as well you're not gonna take sardines with you and i try not to do that kind of thing and so mm-hmm. even hot meals i did fewer hot meals than normal you know i did a little bone broth with noodles but i did a lot of the granola the cold granola mm-hmm. with berries from like peak refuel i did a lot of that and then just my normal kind of stuff, not hot meals, peanut butter bars. Daisy gets those peak refuels from a buddy at her work, and she takes uh, strawberry protein powder mm-hmm. and sprinkles it in there ahead of time. And like the Mountain she, Ops protein mm-hmm. powder? Yeah. Yeah, the strawberries and cream. Yeah. And then when she's there, she fills it up with uh, with ice cold water, and then it's just like... Ready to go, mm-hmm. yeah. Strawberries it's, and... Gro- it's like granolas mm-hmm. and strawberry milk. It already has a little rice milk in it mm-hmm. to begin with, but it's a delicious tasty it's yeah. darn good. i want to make it on my own it's got to be it's just mm-hmm. cheaper mm-hmm. you know do a bunch of berries up and uh de- freeze dry those make your make your own granola all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff it's an easy easy one to make um mm-hmm. add a little bit of dehydrated rice milk to it and or whatever you you're maybe a little whey protein ops strawberry mm-hmm. like you said but like I said, I go so far as to try to keep the food from mm-hmm. being too smelly. It doesn't it's no sweat off my back. I don't really care. I might have a hot meal, you know, every other night or so, especially when I feel like maybe we're in an area where the bears are not likely to just roam into where we're at. Mm-hmm. Secondly, we eat. We try to eat away from our tents, away from mm-hmm. where we're where we're camped. And typically, if the wind is blowing, where wherever the wind's blowing. We try to make sure that if a bear comes into our camp, that we've eaten downwind of our tent. In other words, whatever wherever we store the food as well, it's the same principle. If the wind is blowing to the west, right? If it's blowing to the west, we really want to make sure that our food smell is intercepted before they get to our tent. Mm-hmm. 
right? If they're following the scent of and the in the scent of the wind up to find our food, mm-hmm. we don't want them to have to go through our tent first to get to where the food is a mm-hmm. hundred yards further up. Mm-hmm. We want them to hit the food and stop. Yeah. Okay. So it's good to situate where you're going to eat your food mm-hmm. and where you're going to hang your food, right? Mm-hmm. Downwind of where you're sleeping so that 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 area gets intercepted mm-hmm. and there's no need to wander further to explore mm-hmm. where you're sleeping at or where your camp is at. Okay. You're basically making a triangle between these three places. Yeah, or kind of. I mean, you're paying attention to where the wind is and and where your food is and where your where your um, t- tent is and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, again, you know, we we usually bring our food in some kind of ziplocs big gallon Ziplocs or whatever. And we take that trash and we put it into that, you know, a Ziploc bag and we seal it, try to keep the scent kind of trapped in that plastic. And uh, we take the food and we try to hang it as high as we can in a tree. So we'll take a little rock, throw it around our rope, toss it over a branch. And uh, then we'll hoist our food up into the tree. And then you take that rope and you tie it to a different tree so that the bear doesn't like, mess around at the bottom of the tree and hit your rope and cause it to come down, you know? So it's kind of, mm-hmm. they don't know to go three to the tree next to it, you know, that, so that way you don't get them, you know, getting, if possible, you just try to tie it off somewhere different than the tree that it's in. And you want it on the branch sticking out. They say like six feet out and six feet up or 10 feet up and uh, three feet out or whatever. And the idea there is you put it out on a limb a little bit far from the trunk because these black bears climb pretty good, Mm -hmm. especially smaller ones. And they'll climb up that trunk and then they'll get out and grab your food. But if it's way out on a limb, they, they have a harder time, you know, getting out on that Mm -hmm. limb. But I've seen them on clotheslines going upside down for food. So if a black bear really wants it, um, it's likely he can get it. But just the fact that it's up in the air suspended. Okay. Cause it's, it's when you hang it over a limb, they might crawl out on the limb, mm-hmm. but it's hanging like four feet below them. Mm-hmm. They still can't reach they it. Still can't reach it and, mm-hmm. and they don't quite know how. And so that's kind of how you hang your food so that it doesn't get stolen. Uh, one other thing that you can do is split up your food. So if you have 10 days of food, you might go five hanging in this tree and five hanging in that tree. Because if a bear does get your stash, you're done. Mm-hmm. You got to go back right? Mm -hmm. At least if you split it up, you know, you might have five days and we usually leave a base camp with food and then strike out for a number of days. Mm -hmm. So our food's not all in one place that way. You know, if, if they did get your food, they don't get all of it. Yeah. You know, you still can salvage a few days of hunting and maybe get at least, you know, part of what your, your goal is before you have to hike out because it's an arduous journey getting into some of these (laughs) places. Okay. So, that's how you hang it in the tree. That's how you deal with scent. That's the kind of food I'm even bringing, right? And that's, mm-hmm. I don't leave food in the tent, any food at all. Uh, Ryan is more guilty of this than I am where, you know, he'll have a little coffee in there or a little this or a little that. But he, again, tr- doesn't like open a can of sardines in there, mm-hmm. you know. Usually it's in a package mm-hmm. of some kind. It's like. And is coffee uh, alluring to bears? I think any smell is mm-hmm. almost alluring to bears. <laughs> Uh, they just have such a strong sense of smell. I think they're just attracted to just about, and they think anything is food. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, try not to have anything in the tent, no sugar, no meats, no, no, nothing, you know, try to keep the tent as, as free as food as possible. So they're saying I shouldn't lather my tent down with honey and then no. throw sugar. Bad on idea. It. Bad idea. Yeah. So when you do that, that's, that's kind of one of the ways to manage the scent of food and the smell of food. So you don't attract bears to where you're yeah, at. Makes sense. When I was in British Columbia and I was talking to my friend Lander. Jeff Lander. Yeah. He was describing a, a guy to his that got mauled. And if you go back to our early podcast, maybe in the two hundreds, we have this podcast with him. He talks about how his guy got mauled by a black bear and they had two wall tents set up side by side. And there was the dudes, the dads in one and the, and the boys in the other, like 16, 17, 18, something like that. The boys in the other, and they had a little kitchen they had a moose carcass somewhere nearby. And they hadn't been very careful with the moose carcass. Like they had been in the past. Normally you get complacent year after year, month after month, season after season where, you know, you're, 
you don't ever run into a bear, you start to get maybe a little complacent. Even we find ourselves doing that too. And it's like, you have to remind yourself just because you didn't see one. I remember Renella was talking about a Fognac Island and he has that podcast, the bear tree where he talks about getting, they got, they just got basically attacked by a brown bear Mm -hmm. on a Fognac Island. Um, um, one of the dudes ended up riding on the bear's back as it ran by and rode it mm-hmm. off, kind of fell. You know, it was like, these are close encounters. Remy Warren, they all like swung. Giannis hit it in the face with a trekking pole or something. And the bear <laughs> um, kind of got spooked and ran off. And anyway, it hazed him the, all the way out though. And it was creepy and scary. And this bear was aggressive. Now, the thing about it was they got complacent. Mm-hmm. They got complacent. And Renla said, well, I just didn't think I'd run into a bear. I mean, yeah, sure, you hear about them, people tell you they're there, but I just, I've been in so many grizzly spaces for so long and never really had, you know, any problems that I just sort of discounted it. Now, remember, they had killed this elk and hung it in the tree the -hmm. night before, and they had come back to the kill site Mm -hmm. to get the meat down, not realizing that a bear had moved in overnight. Mm -hmm. So, um, it was scary. So you can't get complacent. And again, it's the food and the blood and the guts. So Mm -hmm. going back to, let's say you kill something, Mm -hmm. how are you going to handle that? Well, you hear these warrior stories from guides up North where they're like, all three guys got mauled while they were trying to, you know, and murdered Mm -hmm. while they were trying to skin a moose, right? By a brown bear or something. You know, if you can have someone paying attention with, with a weapon, bear spray, whatever, that is outward looking and making sure no Mm -hmm. bears are coming, you know, that's ideal, right? You you got Mm -hmm. somebody watching while somebody's breaking down the animal. Do you guys ever like stop a a ways back and glass up ahead of you? Of course. But let's say we just killed it. We we get on it and now we're going to skin it and break it down, take pictures, do the whole thing. Okay. At that point, um, we take a few pictures, but we're just vigilant. We're looking Mm -hmm. everywhere. If the bear died in a situation where it was really dense thick and you couldn't see Mm -hmm. very far i'd want to just drag it out put Mm -hmm. it somewhere else if possible i don't clearing i don't like not being like ranella said that was the thing they made a mistake with was they put it in this tree where they couldn't really see anything it was so dense but if you if they had put the meat in the uh, wide open they could have seen the bear you know as they came up on it right and what they started to seek on their way out or big open spaces so you could easily see the bear coming if it was if it was following you. The dense, thick stuff, that's kind of spooky. But a big black bear is pretty hard to move until it's broke down. Some of them, I mean, they're not lightweight. You know, it's like dragging it's way bigger than a mule deer. You know, it can be. But we've managed, we've managed to drag a black bear like 30, 40 yards to put it in a better spot, you know. Um so then we start to break it down. Okay. And like I said, as you break it down, you're looking behind you. You have a guy kind of paying attention. I think that's smart. It's, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. You got bear spray, you got your weapons handy. Okay. And then when you break it down, um, we're trying to get it down and break broken apart and put in game bags as quickly as possible. And we're trying to get the meat that the, we're grabbing the four quarters, some of the neck and the tenderloins and the, um, back straps. We're grabbing the school and the hide and we're trying to get all of that stowed away in our packs and away from the carcass as quick as possible, away from the guts, away from the, the, the lungs and all the blood and all that kind of stuff. The sooner you can get away from the kill site, you know, and start getting on your way, the, the safer you're going to be. So we are pretty quick and vigilant about all that. And we get out of there. Now it's almost unavoidable that you kill a, an animal right at dark. I mean, we do because, um, uh, it's pretty tough. A lot of times they're just moving at last light. Cause it's so hot in the springtime. That's when you get them. So we're hiking a little bit in the dark in grizzly country with meat on our backs. So we have, we actually have some headlamps that we're prototype testing right now, mm-hmm. but what we had before that was the, the similar thing where it's a really bright headlamp. 
like really bright. So it goes out 30 or 40 yards in front of you, 50 yards or further. And you're running that headlamp and it's strong. And at least one guy is out there, you know, or both. And we're just scanning and looking everywhere for eyeballs or anything. And we're trying to traverse country that's open where we can see everything. So there's no surprises or anything like that. And then we're just vigilant as we hike out, just scanning, 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 scanning. And we've got bear spray with us for protection. And we also have pistols. And so we use the Rasco gear pistol holster Mm -hmm. uh, that mounts to your bino harness. So mine is, I have mine mounted to my marsupial gear, like Leupold bino harness. I've got the pistol set right in there. I've been running that for a while. And uh, we have like, um, the heavy bore, uh, bear, bear loads in there, mm-hmm. the Buffalo bore bullets, um, calibers, you know, it's a big, big debate, a hot debate on what caliber you should run. Um, you know, it is discouraging when you're within 50 yards of a bear and you see how big a grizz is, even the small ones seem huge. Mm-hmm. And, um, it seems like no gun is big enough. <laughs> Sometimes you look at those things, but, um, I carried a 10 millimeter last season, uh, with a, with a fully loaded clip, lots of bullets. Um, there's lots of debates on whether that's the right thing to do or not. A lot of guys carry much bigger pistols. Mm-hmm. Mark had a big revolver, huge vo- revolver, that had, uh, it's made out of some kind of titanium plastic polymer type material. It was pretty lightweight. I need to talk to him a little bit more about that, but, uh, it had a big old bullet in it. I don't know what it was, a 45, um, bigger than that. I, I, I can't remember, but much bigger caliber than when Ryan and I had, we each had nine millimeters and we just had nine millimeter with Buffalo bore bullets. Now we do have big clips. We have a lot of bullets in there. Mm -hmm. Um, but the problem is, you know, Ryan was saying the other day, Brian, more bears are killed by nine millimeter, more grizzly bears are killed by nine millimeter than anything else. But it, but how much mauling does a bear do before before it it dies, even though it does die of a nine millimeter Two, Um, but how often, how, how much is that the case simply because more everyone has a nine millimeter just a mm-hmm. lot it's just that by nature of mm-hmm. the weapon people have more are killed by mm-hmm. it i don't know but bear spray is really our primary first dis- defense that's the goal mm-hmm. and um and then not getting into trouble in the first place you know being vigilant making sure you don't bump into them when you're coming around blind spots or looking around corners you're trying not to run into a sow with cubs you're just kind of always m- going the extra step being careful Traveling in a group, you know, helps having multiple guys together and having the pistols and having the bear spray, uh, you know, some of these guys that carry those huge caliber guns, they can't hit what they're aiming at. And there's so much kick and almost breaks your wrist, you know, and, uh, you can empty maybe one or two shots, a nine millimeter or a 10, you can drop the whole round, you know, as many as you can squeeze off. So, um, that's, that's personal. It's up for debate. Ryan used his pistol this year to scare off a bear. It was about 50 yards from camp, hundred yards the second time. And, um, he fired a couple of shots and that, that freaked that bear out. He ran off. And so, you know, I, I but a bear in mid charge, it's not going to do much. Mm-hmm. And, but bear spray can help. But, um, you're talking about weight, you know, you're already carrying. Now keep in mind, we have rifles and the, and the thing is a six, five RPM is going to hit hard, Mm -hmm. which is what we're carrying. Um, you put that rifle on three power and you might carry it in your hands, Mm -hmm. you know, just in case you need to, but when it gets dark, I'm I'm reaching for bear spray more than anything. If I am getting charged in close Mm -hmm. encounters, but the whole goal is not to get within range of a charge in the first place. Mm-hmm. If you can keep a bear 50 yards to 100 yards away from you, you're probably not going to get charged. They're going to just go the other way. Most charges happen when you surprise a bear and you happen to be right in their 
their space and your space at the same time and everybody's surprised and a mama just comes over and mauls you mm-hmm. or an aggressive boar just because you were too close, you know? So anyway, um, when we get to where we can hang the meat, we hang it safely far, far from camp with the proper wind. So again, you know, they're not going through our tent on their way to the meat. Make sure you put the meat downwind of where you're at so that, um, you know, that bear smells, uh, hits the meat before it hits you. But we hang it much like we do with the food, you know, out on a limb as far as we can, as high as we can, draping down from the limb so no critters can get to it. And then we go and we do a good job. We try to wash our hands and clean up in the river so we don't, we're not covered in blood and smelly, um, yummy, tasty guts and stuff. So we try to clean up from there. And again, then we practice all of our scent control and stuff around food and camp. So that's, that's kind of how we handle that situation. Now with bear spray, you know, you, you want to practice with it a little bit. You also want to make sure that you're not spraying it so that the wind is blowing in your face because it'll get you, especially mm-hmm. in some of these mountain hunts, it's pretty stiff wind. And if the bear were to charge with the wind blowing at you, um, you need to reach for the pistol instead because that's where bear spray is not going to help you much. Um, I don't know what to say. You know, if you do get charged, you're kind of screwed to some extent because, Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's just, you want to avoid that from the get go. So Ryan and I have been talking about this because we love hunting these areas, but we know you're playing a little bit of Russian roulette when it comes to grizzly bears, because they're just there. You're in their space. And when you're hunting, you're sneaking around. It's not like you're mm-hmm. wearing a cowbell around your neck and you're like, here we are, we're here. And the bear knows mm-hmm. ahead of time. It's easy to surprise one because you're sneaking around trying to sneak up on black bears or deer, or elk, whatever it might be. So, so we had the llamas, right? Livisay went with us on this year's, uh, um, one of our hunts in Grizz country. And the llamas gave us so much added security. Because these llamas, they smell better than we do. They hear better than we do. They see predators coming before we do. They're, those llamas were switched on. A couple of them were like great guard dogs. And llamas are known for being guard animals, mm-hmm. you know, attacking coyotes and things that come and try to get to sheep. You know, you have a llama in there and it'll, it'll, it'll break the back of a coyote or a wolf even. And they're, they're ready to fight. Mm-hmm. So we stationed a llama by each teepee at night so that our backs were protected. And if a bear came in, get the llama before it got us, that helped us sleep tremendously better, much yeah. better, Have much a better. Have goat or two. Yeah. yeah. Make me feel better too. And so that, that llama though, when the grizz came into camp and was coming in, those llamas went nuts and they made this weird sound just like, you know, they would, that allows you to get up and go, Hey, hey, hey and multiple guys. And the thing is, is, Bears, black or grizz, they don't like numbers mm-hmm. and big animals. Like too many of the same. It's, they like a one-on-one fight, mm-hmm. you know. They aren't known that much for charging multiple people or groups of people because groups of people scare them a little bit more. Like five guys, it's not very common or heard of. Three guys can happen. Under three, definitely. But the more the dudes... And the more the voices, the more the yelling, the more the group, generally the less likely a grizz is to uh, charge. In fact, you know, Ranella mentioned that, and, and Remy and stuff, one of the reasons that perhaps that bear busted into the thicket where these, where they were at, but once it realized it wasn't one group of pe- one dude or one animal on his mm-hmm. kill, it was a whole bunch of guys going all different directions it kind of confused the bear, spooked him and caused him to, to just run off. Run off. But it, it didn't stop that bear from coming back and hazing them and bluff charging them and stuff through the trees mm-hmm. and wolfing at them and scaring the hell out of them as they got their meat down and tried to get out of there. So the llamas were great. They kept, um, they kept, they helped us feel a little safer. The other thing that we did, we talked about was a dog having bear a bear deterrent type dog there. When I hunted in um, British Columbia in the Cassiar Mountains with Dustin Rowe, mm-hmm. Tannis and Doran and that crew, the New Zealand crew that was there, Randy Newberg hunted with them too, a few other people, uh, Adam Greentree, 
John Barklow, the Sitka guys. Dustin's a legend up there. And Dustin had two dogs that he packs with. And they were mutts. They were like a mix. I don't remember what the mix was. I think Boxer was in there. Might have been Boxer, Great Dane. It was some some crazy mix, whatever. But those dogs crushed it up in those mountains. And they would carry about, I think he was saying they were carrying 20 or 30 pounds. Each? Each. So 10 to 15 pounds on each side of their back. Mm -hmm. And those dogs could pack a sheep off a mountain with him. And so he had pack bags custom made for these tall, taller dogs. But they handled the winter great. He did have coats for them when it got real nasty. But the thing, the biggest thing for them was grizzly bears. Mm -hmm. just flat out grizzly bears. Sitka was there to keep the grizzly bears away. That's the name of the dog. And you can get out into some places and the dog is going to intercept when that bear is sub 330 yards. You're like, you bumped into him and that bear starts to come. That dog is going to go ape crazy and charge that bear. And that bear pulls up like, wait, wait a minute. Who's on the attack? And what and it gets distracted it allows you to have the time to get your weapon aimed or do what you need to do get your bear spray ready or back off and um, multiple dogs is tremendously effective at keeping uh, a grizzly bear at bay ryan has been digging into it a little bit and he's actually found a couple australian shepherd uh, breeders that specifically breed dogs to deter grizzly bears mm -hmm. so guys can hunt and camp and do things and they have specific dogs that are there that are there to just, they're just grizzly dogs. They're just there to deter grizzlies. And uh, I think that's probably one of the safest and most powerful means of protecting yourself is a dog. It truly is. If you have the right dog. We're just exploring that option as well. Llamas, some, a dog would be great. A couple of dogs. We love dogs. I've always had dogs my whole life except for the last couple few years. And I backpacked with dogs a lot. You know, and they have their own pack bags. We gave, we put in dog food for the days and they carried their dog food in. But as they would eat their own dog food a little bit here and there, here and there, here and there over the course of a week, when you come out, you can load them up mm -hmm. with a little extra meat and they can pack it out. And, and dogs are actually great pack animals under, under utilized pack animals. I think a dog can carry 20% of its weight. So what they say are 25%. So, uh, you know, a hundred pound dog is carrying 25 pounds. Uh, I think though that, um, they can carry much more than that. Um, it just depends on their conditioning and their fitness and so on, at least for a short period, a short distance. Um, you look at Siberian Huskies, right? Th those things are, those things are hauling sled dogs. You know, they're fiercely hauling a sled across pulling, you know, hundreds of pounds in a sled team. They're built to do some work, right? Mm -hmm. And so dogs are, are, you look at the Native Americans, they would use dogs uh, in a Travoy system where they would um, basically, before they had horses, they would fasten two poles to the dog. And then it would have a drag behind it, two poles with a, with a, with a like material in between, um, a hide or something. And then they would stack all their belongings on that. And the dog mm. would drag mm. that later. Once they got horses, they just did the same system, but on horses. But for thousands of years, the natives were using dogs for as beasts of burden as their, their means of hauling and, and tra traveling and carrying their, their, uh, gear. Same is true today. So I think dogs like Dustin's like, they work, dude, it works great. And, uh, w I got to experience them out there hauling and stuff. And I think some of the hardest things is coming up with a bat, a pack that really mm -hmm. works well, but you do a little Google search, you'll find there's a lot of really great packs out there now. Wolf packs is one that I owned for a while with my Mastiffs, and they would be 120 pound dogs. And Indy could call, he could haul some serious weight, um, 30 pounds easy, and go all day, and and work hard. Um, so every dog. Uh, but having having a dog that can pack a little, you know, he can pack his own food. He can justify his own 
coming. You know, you don't have to worry about that too much, but on the way out, there's no reason why he can't be hauling at least 20 pounds of your stuff, Mm -hmm. which doesn't hurt. Um, so that's another thing. Um, having a dog, having llamas or horses or any kind of pack animal there can help kind of protect the situation. So, um, gosh, what else to deter bears keep from getting mauled? I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, how we do it. Um, like I said, it's, it's really keeping the food, Mm -hmm. keeping bears away in the first place is being really responsible with the smell and how you handle food. Secondly, it's not bumping into them in the first place. So being vigilant, not going around corners blind as much as possible. You Mm -hmm. know, if you are going around a corner on a trail, make a little noise before you're getting there. Give, give whatever you've got for the sow with cubs time to know that there's something around the corner, you know, stuff like that. Usually when we're hiking, you know, we have good visibility when we're up in those alpine areas, we can see a grizz. We know where it went. We're not walking up on blind corners. So we're too close to them. And then, um, you know, don't run from a bear. I'm not going to do you much good. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you got to stand your ground and, and you got to fight. You got to, you got to wave your arms. You're not going to outrun them. And if you mm-hmm. do run them, run from them, it'll probably trigger the prey response and they'll, mm-hmm. they'll get you. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'd like to do more on the weapons, the guns, but I think honestly, the way that the grizzly attacks have been on the rise over there in like Wyoming and Montana and in certain zones, I just think having a dog, a couple of dogs mm-hmm. is really um, in a smart way. And nobody wants to hunt with dogs, but if you train your dogs well, they can, they can mm-hmm. uh, behave when you're on the hunt. They can, they can be there and you not screw up and not screw up your hunt. I watched it with, with Dustin, mm-hmm. his dogs. He's like, lay down. They would <clears> go <throat> flat to the ground and they just stay. And then they do their thing and sheep would be coming and those dogs will not move them. You, if you told those dogs to stay, pity those dogs. And you forgot <laughs> to tell them that they ha- they could get up now. Mm-hmm. They'll be there five hours later. Like, mm-hmm. you know, so uh, you can train a, a dog, a smart dog easily. We did lots of stuff like that. I trained a lot of my dogs and. Uh, there was a key word in there. Trained. Smart. Smart. Yeah, that's true. Like. <laughs> I had, you have stubborn dogs and you have smart dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and the and occasional some are dumb dog. But you have the dumb ones. The dumb ones are hard. They're mm-hmm. hard. I don't like dumb dogs. Typically, if I found I got a dumb dog. Mulligan. I, I, I give it to someone else. <laughs> yeah. There's always some sucker who wants a dumb dog. Yeah. Um, He's so pretty. I like the really yeah, smart. the wall. I like the really smart ones. I really mm-hmm. like the smart ones. For those who don't know, I bred borbles for like. 14? 10, 12 years or something. Long time. We, we placed over 130 or 40 puppies in homes over the years. And we did a lot of protection work with them, personal protection. We did a lot of obedience training. And they would range from hyper-athletic, brindle male f- from the Netherlands, like scary fit, can jump like six feet onto a six-foot wall from the ground, being 140 pounds, to your 200-pound guys that just weren't very athletic at all. Um, but, um, I think dogs are, they're hard to beat as far as a protector or a deterrent when you're out there in Grizz country. Um, that's why Dustin runs them, you know, and on certain hunts, that's why they got them around. And that's why man has been using dogs since the beginning of time to go out there. I mean, it's a great companion to have. Um, which dog, that's a big question for debate. I'd be curious to hear what some people say. Um, you can Google and they'll say the best, the 10 best dogs for, um, grizzly bear deterrence. There's actually articles and pages written on those. And it's a pretty interesting read when you get out there and you look that up. I think I have it right here on a Google search I did the other day. Um, 10 best hiking dog. Um, yeah, hiking dogs for outdoor adventure. Now this isn't to deter necessarily for the grizzly protection type of dog, but, um, they're for actually living outdoors and hiking with, this is the article that, that was in highconsumption.com, uh, wilderness article. They had the Australian cattle dog, which I totally agree. Um, 
I've seen those things at work. They're incredible, but they bark and they're, they got a loud bark and they're, it's almost impossible to train them to shut up. But, um, but they are a no fear. I mean, they go after 2000 pound bulls and try to herd them up, you know? So cattle dogs are pretty impressive, bold little suckers. The Australian shepherd, that one just keeps coming up in every search, mm-hmm. but they're so freaking hairy, you know, but the Australian shepherd, and that's what this couple, this, this one that Ryan's looking at for as a bear dog. Um, that's what they're breeding. It's an Australian shepherd. Um, and, uh, it's basically there to, you know, where are they getting this dog from? Um, you know, out in Montana, I think it's a Mon- I think it's a, Mon- a breeder in Montana or Wyoming, you know, and they specifically breed these Australian shepherds to have the bold personality and, and stuff and the key and the drive to, mm-hmm. to scare off a grizzly bear. You know, the last thing you want is one that pees itself and runs away. Um, Bernie's mountain dog. I, I, and again, I, th- oh, that's what, that's what, uh, was mixed. I think with, um, it was a boxer and oh. Bernie's mountain dog, I think with, mm, uh, Dustin's yeah. with Dustin's, uh, that would be they turned out to be quite short haired, um, mm-hmm. the pups he got from, from this breeder. But I think a mix is really the way to go. Mm-hmm. Having done a lot of purebred stuff and seen purebreds, there's something about hybrid vigor. When you introduce two separate gene pools that are just mm-hmm. so dynamic, you just have so many fewer health issues. The joints, everything seems to just, you get that hybrid vigor mm-hmm. and those animals thrive. So the Bernese Mountain Dog from the farmlands of Switzerland. Again, I don't think purebred is the way to go, but you get one mixed. Border Collie. Border Collie is the other one that's a bear dog that uh that ryan has been looking into um so the australian shepherd border collie bernie's mountain dog um, so you're herding dogs basically your cattle dogs so far Sick. yeah all cattle dogs um now here's one german short-haired pointer mm-hmm. uh but i think they're on the border line of dumb uh <laughs> yeah i i've run into a lot of german short-haired pointers and they they know how to hunt but outside of that, it's like talking to a brick wall. Um, and they they might be a little too free-spirited to actually stay near you when mm-hmm. they need to be. They'll wander way off and go somewhere else. But Labrador Retriever, that's a, that's a pretty easy one, right? Mm-hmm. I had a lab for years, and I backpacked with Raven. I called her name was Raven. I backpacked with her everywhere. Um, she was awesome, awesome. Mm-hmm. But in those spring and summer hunts, those spring September hunts, I th- they can get hot hiking too much, and mm-hmm. you just think I got a big old fur coat on them, you know. But a Labrador Retriever mix, I think, is a great foundation, great foundation. Um, and the Portuguese Water Dog, those are just goofy looking. Of all the dogs on the list, I find the Portuguese Water Dog the ugliest, but they do have a good reputation. They were bred to herd fish into nets. They're like swimmers. Brent's, out, <laughs> Brent's whipping out the Google search. Um, and then Rhodesian Ridgeback. I believe Borbel had some of that in their, their lines mixed in there from Zimbabwe. The Rhodesian Ridgeback is a great dog too. I've seen some amazing mm. ones. I think they could carry a lot of load. But again, I almost want to mix with every single one of these. You know, this water dog looks much floofier than I thought it was going yeah. to. And then the Siberian Husky, that thing is right up there. Um, cold water dog, but they're practically wolves, but they are, man, they're hard headed. They're independent. They're stubborn. I mean, they're built to haul a sled across the Arctic. And, um, how about a wolfhound? <laughs> no. Yeah. And then they have on here Visla. I don't agree. I don't think that's a good one. I think that too many Vislas are neurotic, in my opinion. They they can form tight bonds with their humans, and I think some are awesome, but they can be needy, too needy. I'm just not. I'm just n- not. Me and you are too harsh to be owning a Visla. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to kick a dog in the yeah. head when it pisses me off. And then I want it to be sorry, dad and roll, yeah. let it roll, not have its feelings hurt. And, and then be wondering about, you know, whether I love it or not for the next mm-hmm. like week, I need a, I need a mentally tougher dog. Um, 
So, but um, I think the Visla is great for the warm weather. I mean, it really is a great warm weather dog, whereas the Husky has to be in cold weather, colder weather. It just, it struggles in, uh, in those heated, heated hunts. So, yeah, I'm leaning towards something like the Ridgeback, a Retriever, uh, Border Collie, Bernice Mountain Dog, Australian Shepherd Mix. Australian cattle dog. I'd even go with a Rottweiler, uh, you know, Australian shepherd or Bernice mountain dog kind of mix. Uh, I think Rottweilers are a great breed for that too. Just with the right mix. Mm -hmm. You know, I also think German shepherd belongs in this list, Mm -hmm. but again, some of these animals have been bred so poorly due to, um, due to the show dog industry and just the modern world we live in that their Mm -hmm. working abilities have gone down the drain and they've traded in a dog's working ability for its, um, aesthetic, aesthetic look, look, um, giving no regard to its, its functionality. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of broken dogs in the U S I got a friend who has a Russian, um, deer hound. Mm. You ever seen those? Mm -mm. Um, imagine like the Irish, no, deer hound? not Irish. Those things Russian. Are... Okay. Okay, no. This thing looks freaky. <laughs> looks like a buzzsaw got with a dog. Its face, it's kid you not, its is face. Is it white? It, yeah, yeah. It was white, yeah. Yeah. But its face is like 14 inches long, and yeah. it's just like a pike snout. Yeah. It's just long like a hamburger bun it. and teeth. Yeah. <laughs> and it, 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 it was sweet, but like it was kind of crippled. Yeah. But, and it wasn't that old. It just like was so inbred that it just had bad... They're normally supposed to be really tall. Yeah. And they just lope. They can like I said, forever. I think a mix, but <clears throat> temperament's everything. Temperament, intelligence. Yeah. That's so much of it. But uh, yeah, I'm going to be looking around for a, a dog that's functional mm-hmm. that, um, you know, I might even get the breeding stock myself and produce my own pups. You know, get a male and a female from two different two different purebred lines and, and then mix it up because... Um, that's one way to get a good dog. Yeah. I got, I got the nose. How mm-hmm. got the, I got the experience. So might do that anyway. I hope you found this interesting and uh, useful to you. And it prevents you from getting mauled by bears in the, in the back country. I'm sure there's things I missed. We'll, we'll cover this subject again with some more experts. Um, I didn't really get into the type of guns. I did do a little research on guns actually that will stop a bear charge. And the list of guns that will actually stop a bear charge and mid charge um, are short and they're big and they're big. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they're not necessarily great beyond 150 yards, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's not like it's a dual weapon it's not like you're carrying it for bear protection mm-hmm. and you're going to use it to kill your bear and that kind of sucks yeah. you don't want to carry that, two rifles that secondary rifle you bring for the grizzly it's going to be like a 10 pound rifle yeah it's not going to be small african the one they use in africa and i forget which the safari load yeah whatever that one was the, thing, the bullet is literally the length of like my middle finger but that it's thing huge. that thing guys will hunt with out to 250 <sighs> yards uh, they'll sight it in and they'll use it for that short range. It'll yeah. stop the, uh, a charging, yeah, uh, bull, um, Cape Buffalo black death. So there, there are, there's a couple of guns that kind of can, um, mm. put their feet in both worlds yeah. as the hunting gun and the protection gun. But in general, a lot of those guns that stop them are, uh, are a good hundred yard max kind of gun and typically mm. better 50 yards and under 70 yards and under. So, um, open sites, that's a whole new, like Mm -hmm. discussion, actually getting the right gun to stop a charge. We're not going to cover that today. We didn't even bring something like that on our hunts. Um, there is the possibility, you know, you have a bear, um, you know, shotguns, the other thing, you know, a sawed off shotgun or a short, a shotgun with slugs and you, you, they have Mm -hmm. those bore, bore loads and, all the U.S. Forest Service agents that are dealing with Grizz, they carry shotguns because it's an affordable mm-hmm. size gun. They carry those giant slugs, and you can p- mm-hmm. pump action, boom, boom, or a fully auto, boom, mm-hmm. boom, boom, with your uh, or semi-auto with your with your uh, shotgun. Mm-hmm. And that's what Ryan carried in Kamchatka 
when he was over there in Russia guiding fishing, they'd carry those shotguns. And so that's a pretty common, I looked at that and it's a lighter weight option. That'll mm-hmm. kick out a giant slug and you get those Buffalo bore oh, man, slugs. No. The shotgun, if you're going to take a shotgun though with you, it's got to be fairly lightweight. Yeah. And there's quite a few that are built like that, but it's going to kick like a son of a gun. It is. It is, I but a, I think I when have a shock wave or a Mossberg shock wave. Now they said that if you'd use that with the Buffalo bore slugs, you'll break your wrist. Yes. Cause it has to have, you, you got to have a stock mm-hmm. on it to, to take the, and hit. I wonder because a lot of States wouldn't allow you because it's too short to put a stock on it. Some States allow you to yeah. put a stock and a pistol grip on it, which is what really needs to happen with my gun. I, it's, I put a hundred rounds through it to break it in. Uh-huh. It took me and two buddies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're good friends, good guys. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, it's no, it's you know, having a stock on it is 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 mm-hmm. uh, on on a gun like that, you know, critical. But yeah, so that's a whole different discussion. We need to go into that. But you got to carry it with you, and it's almost mm-hmm. with enough guys going, you could have a guy designated with the bear gun or whatever. Mm-hmm. He could go in the front, and but I'm telling you, man, I just let me ask you, Brian. I just really do feel like a dog is a much better deterrent much safer option than relying on you hitting the target in that moment of truth with, Mm -hmm. with a, with a shotgun or whatever weapon you've got. Um, you know, a dog will probably, I think a dog will be much better deterrent than a gun. Yeah. It'll just detect it sooner. And yeah, right. It just knows Mm -hmm. and it's keen for the fight, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just think, um, Sometimes people are like, oh, a bear would just destroy that dog. And the thing is, though, they don't because a bear is just shocked that a, that this mm-hmm. animal is actually willing to, like, stand up to it. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the bear is confused, just like a mountain lion when a pack of dogs come after it. Yeah. It's more like the shock. It's, it's like, like the a bear, wolverine, dude. A wolverine's not big. Right. It's like the bear doubts itself. Mm-hmm. Like, this little dog must know something <laughs> about itself that I'm not aware of because yeah. it's not afraid of me like it should be. It should be running. It should be running, but it's not. Now, that's got me worried. It's mm-hmm. like the alarm bells go off in the yeah. grizz head and uh, causes them to, like, second guess. Now, when I was with Bart Lancaster, he actually had a uh, full-on bear dog. Um, those dogs bred in Russia or whatever for um, for bear for hunting bears. They actually use them to hunt bears. A, Car- uh, a Karelian bear dog. So what is that basically like a pit an Australian shepherd put together? No. Uh, check it out. I mean, it looks like an Akita almost. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so uh, you read about these dogs. Now, his dog was super awesome i mean but these these carillion carillion bear dogs um i mean take a look at this guy i mean this is almost identical it what his what bart's dog looked like mm-hmm. that thing was a beast it was lightning fast it it's just but when you have a dog that that, that is that hot tenacious you know territorial it's it's brave it's it's intense when you have a dog like that, you got to live with it when you're not in the mountains and when you're not around bears and when you're not chasing bears. And these things are built for chasing bears. They say they do okay with kids, but I've had dogs that were working dogs that were built for like guarding, you know, a, 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 a police facility or, or, you know, military facility, a Malinois. Man, that's a lot of dog to have year round. It's not for everybody. It's just, it's just not. That's why an Australian Shepherd works so well because it can be your pet going down the street, but it can also protect you from the bear. But these Karelian bear dogs are pretty cool and pretty interesting, and I'm intrigued. I just um, Bart's dog was well trained, very well trained, but he also kept it working all the time. I think it's the sort of dog that might go around killing all the cats in the neighborhood if you <laughs> didn't give it a job to do. But uh, I don't really know enough about him. But Bart's dog, you hang out with it in camp, and you fall in love with that thing. It just It's just such a comfort to have it around. You just know there's no Grizz that's going to give you too much trouble when that thing's around. He's going to intercept. So anyway, 
We're rambling on. I hope you enjoyed this one. Let us know what you think. If you got information about breeds and dogs and bear deterrents and strategies that we didn't mention, we'd love to hear from them. Put them in the comment fields uh, in the description videos for us. Uh, send us an email. Go to our briancall.com. Look, look, look us up there. But especially in YouTube, that's a great way to get a hold of us and leave a comment in there, leave links in there. And we will, we try to read all the comments as much as we can on our, on our YouTube channel. That's where, that's the go-to place. So check that out. And, uh, it better yet though, the other place where we really try to engage is at the Gritty Stealthy Community on Locals.com. And so if you go to gritty.locals.com, gritty.locals.com through your web browser, you can sign up and become a member. I think it's 77 bucks for a year mm-hmm. for an annual, uh, yeah. which break, break that up by month. It's, it's about seven bucks a month, but you get a free month if you go for the annual. Yeah. So it's cool. Or you can just sign up for month to month. But if you sign up for the annual, you get access to the group. You can leave comments. You can mm-hmm. engage with us. We try to read There's your comments three and engage. Podcasts that have been dropped this week that are on there alone. Yeah, three, three, three podcasts just this week that are exclusive to members that are support, paying supporters, and we're gonna have films out there that are just for that crew too every year. But I really like the community that's developing out there. Uh, if you're sick of social media, cancel culture, and all that, we can engage and share as much as we want. I'm I'm in charge of the community, <laughs> and it's only people that are leaving comments or people who have signed up to become a member. And what that does is the trolls are gone. There's really no trolling. No trolls. It's pretty nice because I don't have to deal with some jack wagon who wants to get on there and act the fool. So check it out, folks. Gritty.locals.com. And uh, we're trying to engage more and more and more over there and drop more and more exclusive content over there. We're slowly building it. So be patient for all of you that have become supporters over there. It's going to get better all the time. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.